Hello, we are back for another episode of Movies About Music. And what movie did we see this week? Whiplash. Whiplash. This is a movie、mm-hmm. that when you and I first met, we bonded over this movie. That is not entirely correct. Okay, tell me,、right. tell me how you remember things. So after we started dating、yeah. in Chiang Mai,、mm-hmm. we got together. You asked me, by the way, did you like Whiplash? And I said, no, I hated it. Like, oh, thank God. Because you wanted to check if I hated it. And that was very, it was very important to you that I hate it. Yeah, and you did. And I think that's.、Um... That's what sealed the deal. No, I'm just kidding. No, I think it actually did because you were very relieved that、yeah. I hated it. Yeah, because I don't understand why people like this movie. Oh, you know what? I'm just going to say this because I'm prone to hyperbole.、Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I also don't really care what people think about what I'm about to say because I feel it very strongly. And I don't feel very strongly about a lot of things, but this one I can really stand behind. That's not true, but go ahead. <laughs> Um, I don't think I have a lot of respect for anybody who really likes this movie. Okay. You're throwing down the gauntlet right、mm-hmm. away there.、Mm-hmm. Um, but I think I feel the same way.、Yeah. I wonder what people are enjoying when they're enjoying this movie. Right. I mean, I, I will understand somebody who says, well, I enjoyed it because I know nothing about this art form or whatever. Right. But I don't think I. If, if, if anybody says, like, I loved this movie Whiplash, it like, really changed my life and、mm-hmm. it made me want to pursue like, jazz drumming or whatever.、Mm-hmm. I don't think I would have any respect for it. Well,、her. I think if that's the case, you're in it for the wrong reasons. Yes. You know, when people have a different opinion about something, and,、mm-hmm. and that's fine. Obviously, there's an element to,、mm-hmm. of you know, personal preference to things. I just want someone to explain to me why they like this movie. Right. If they say they like this movie,、mm-hmm. like, I'm not going to do some kind of purity test. Right. You know, if you don't like this movie, I want to hear your argument because I hate everything about this movie. But、yeah. before we get into、mm-hmm. that, we probably j- just lost half of our listeners, I would imagine. I don't really care about that half. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We, <laughs> we, we're going to talk about what we want to talk about. What did you like about this movie? Let's start with that question. I liked the arrangement of Caravan at the very end. That's, yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that, was, that was a great arrangement. It was a great arrangement. I was like, ooh, I like this.、Mm-hmm. You know, it was kind of burning. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Obviously, they got some drummer to play、uh-huh. the drums. That was really the only time when I heard the drums really s i n g really Yeah,、shine. me too. Yeah, yeah. And the band sounded great, of course. Yeah. Is there anything else you liked about this no. movie? No, me neither. <laughs> we have not planned, we, we don't script any of our podcasts.、Mm-hmm. So, just so everybody knows, but I am of the exact same opinion. There's、mm-hmm. nothing else to like about this movie.、Mm-hmm. I agree with you 100%. And I asked you that question genuinely to see if there's something、mm-hmm. else you like. There's nothing else I liked in this movie、mm-hmm. other than that last performance.、Mm-hmm. And I suppose from here, we should, I would imagine listeners, and maybe there's some listeners who love the movie, and they would probably want to know why we have such passionate feelings about this movie.、Mm-hmm. Do, would you like to start that, or would you like me to start that, or how do you want to approach this? Okay, well, I think I have a couple of things to say to preface everything else that I'm about to say. Okay. My reaction, I think, is more visceral than yours because I'm not a drummer.、Mm-hmm. Um, I also only have acquaintances who've been in these conservatories and these big band kind of contexts. I have, myself have never been in one of them.、Mm-hmm. I've also never pursued music on that level. On that Olympian athlete level. Me neither, nowhere、mm-hmm. close. Oh, okay. I, but because I consider you closer to being like a musician of, I, I, I don't know, like I. No, no, for, no, you are, you went to Berkeley, right? I never yeah, went to Berkeley. For like any, one year. <laughs> yeah, but I never did it. I never had my drumming scrutinized like、uh, that. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, I, as a singer, You don't really have that at all.、It's、yeah, you can sing. It's mostly or you like, yeah, yeah. You, you sing, and then it's like, oh, great, encouragement. And then, like, yeah, we, we would take turns like soloing, scat singing, and whatever.、Mm-hmm. And like, if you demonstrate a better awareness of harmony and rhythm, then yeah, you're more advanced or whatever. But like, it doesn't take like a sports level. Even in jazz singing, it doesn't really do that.、Mm-hmm. And I've never been in that league of jazz singing ever, to、okay. my regret.、Mm-hmm. I've always wanted to.、Mm-hmm. What I should have done is I should have pursued an undergrad degree if I wanted to do that. But my parents were not willing to help me pay for music school after I had already completed a, ma- like a, a degree.、Mm-hmm. I'm, saying, I'm explaining this for a reason. The reason I'm explaining this is because 
I have seen somewhat of a version of this. This is not entirely like a fantasy, This the, the, no, whole, the yeah, premise of yeah, this yeah, movie. Yeah. I know that these spaces exist. Mm-hmm. And I know that there is sort of like a sports kind of element to jazz education. Yeah, okay. I have never been part of it. And so I just wanted to say that. I just wanted to put that out there. So sure. I don't, I'm not like an expert in what goes on in jazz education or like a big band setting, mm-hmm. right? That being said, I just found all of this so corny. Like it was so corny and it felt like it was written by someone who had e- who was even c- more clueless than I am. Like, you know, mm-hmm. far more clueless than I am. Mm-hmm. And who has never even met an actual jazz musician before. Like it felt like yeah. It felt so random. Mm-hmm. And that's what I find so unforgivable about that this movie. It's that it wasn't clever, it wasn't funny. The lines were really corny. Every weird cliche was thrown into it. It's like some boxing movie martial arts cliche was thrown into it. And there were some wildly inaccurate depictions of just mm-hmm. everything. Life in New York, everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Before we get to that, mm-hmm. let's let's go with this competition element right. and the cliche element. Mm-hmm. Um, because those are two things that I think are important to hit. There's absolutely no shred of humor in this movie mm-hmm. at all. There's no there's no element of passion in this movie mm-hmm. at all in a good way. Right. There's no joy for music at all. Mm-hmm. There's never an expression of joy mm-hmm. for music, mm-hmm. even at the end. Clichés abound. You know, like another mm-hmm. movie that people seem to love that I didn't like is Slumdog Millionaire because mm-hmm. it just loaded on the clichés right. of India that any average Joe who spent a week Mm -hmm. in India, Mm -hmm. you know, knows, but doesn't really have anything to do with the country. Yeah, it was Um, an English movie. Okay, yeah. Set in India. (laughs) Yeah. Okay, who's the director's name? Damien Chazelle or something like that? I guess he's got a jazz background. He did uh, La La Land, which I actually... From what I've heard, Mm -hmm. because I've looked into this. Okay. He doesn't really have a jazz background. Okay, but he seems to love jazz. I think he wanted to be a jazz musician. Okay. Like, I think he went to Harvard or something. La La Land is another movie that I hated, but I also, I appreciated the arrangements. I actually kind of, I surprised myself by actually enjoying La La Land. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you go into a movie and you're in a good mood or whatever. Right. And I was um, in a foul mood. Yeah. I enjoyed La La Land mm-hmm. and people were like... Oh, God, no. But I I thought it was a fun movie. But anyway, it's the same director. I wonder what his what his background is. I, I just know that he has an interest in jazz, but it doesn't seem like he has any knowledge. I don't think he's ever played in a jazz band is yeah, what I'm trying to yeah. say. But yeah, it's like he seemed to have a, um, a fetish for blood. Yes. Bleeding. Yes. I mean, they showed like three drummers competing for the chair. Mm-hmm. And they're bleeding. Every every one of yeah. them is bleeding everywhere. And yeah. There's blood all over the drums. I defy anyone to tell me that that ever really happens. What happens is if you get a blister, you can get it like a right. serious blister, right. but you're not going to be bleeding all over your drum kit. It's not. That's it what just, I thought It just too. doesn't happen that way. Yeah, because I, I I would say I would think that it's kind of the same type of blister you get pole dancing Mm -hmm. and you don't bleed like you could get like very chafed and blistered well the other thing is if if you're like when i was first drumming Mm -hmm. i i was you know i took lessons at at first and i should say that i had a nazi for a teacher right and he actually sapped my spirit for drumming Mm -hmm. for a period of time this is when I was very young. I was 13 mm-hmm. years old and he was very demanding. And as a 13 year old, I wasn't ready for that. And I gave up the drums. And then I got back into the drums again later. But I don't think I developed the right grip. Oh, okay. So there's different kind of grips you can right. have. And I'd been gigging and playing and all mm-hmm. that. And I developed a blister on my right finger, right at the mm-hmm. joint where it meets the hand. And what happens is you pile up this skin. So I had this raised skin on my finger from a lot of gigging. Right. So if he's doing a lot of playing, he's going to build up blisters. You want blisters like a guitar player, yeah, right? Yeah. The only reason why you would get you would be bleeding on your drums is if you don't play. Mm. But then the other thing is when I retrain my grip, you don't get that blister anymore. So I don't have that blister. Oh, I also haven't been playing okay. a lot recently, but that blister went away because I changed my grip. But in both senses, you shouldn't be bleeding on your kit. Right. There's no way. Like bleeding so profusely. Yeah. And there's blood yeah. everywhere. Yeah, and it's weird. It was weird. He also had a thing about sweat. But no, the the element that you were really getting at that I wanted to respond to is this idea of competition. Mm -hmm. Just from a music perspective, music should never be a competition. Mm -hmm. I've always hated even the idea of battle of the bands, Right. you know, where you have bands and they compete Mm -hmm. for a prize based on audience response or something. And I would always say bands should not be fighting against each other. Mm -hmm. It should just be music. Yeah. I mean, if you're better... 
mm-hmm. than the than the other drummer, you know, for jazz band, mm-hmm. then you should get the main chair, mm-hmm. right? And the other one, but I don't even think it works that way. I think there's I, a I think there's a main drummer, and then yeah. the other understudy turns the pages until the other guy graduates, probably. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't think it's think this so. dickish yeah. kind of competition. No, it's not. It's not. It's n- it never is. The the school that is really famous for having like a really good big band is North Texas mm. University. And they have, you know, just a bunch of big bands. Like they have like maybe it's like one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock band. So the one o'clock band is like the most advanced level or whatever. And they're usually like juniors and seniors, obviously. Mm-hmm. And you kind of go up, but nobody is competing for, you know, you yeah. audition at the beginning of the year, I think. Right. I'm saying this because that was the school that I got accepted okay. to. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know yeah. what the actual facts are about, right. these, about these kind of situations, but I wouldn't imagine that's the case. And if that was the case, I don't think the three drummers who are vying mm-hmm. for the chair would be total dicks to each other. They, they're not. That's exactly what I was about to get at. In no audition or school band kind of situation have I seen anybody be hostile. You know, it's it's not a sport. It's not boxing. Right. It's not a martial art even. You know, it's music. It's music, right. <laughs> yeah. Just... And that was the element to me that I think is bad for music. Mm-hmm. I think it paints music in a bad light. Mm-hmm. But of course, a movie has to have conflict, right? And mm-hmm. so that's just the creation of tension. Yeah. But then here's where I come to my next problem. In order to what? Like, what is the point of this movie? You know what? That's what I was saying since the beginning of the movie, right? Because I, I pointed out two things. As soon as the movie started, I said, this is even more painful and more ridiculous than my first viewing. Yeah, I found and I it, turned to you. You said that, and yeah. I turned to you and said, I agree. It was painful to watch. And I also said, this whole movie is wildly unnecessary. Mm-hmm. But then I kind of figured out why this movie was so popular was as popular as it was okay well there's two things like what is the purpose of this movie like in terms of the story but then why is it so popular well i think it's a variation of this like very instagram viral like phenomenon of like if you want to be rich hustle you know like there's a lot of guys on instagram and i don't know what they actually do for a living but they're screaming at you it's like if you're not waking up at 4 a.m if you're not putting 300 percent it's like and it's like i don't know what they do and i don't know what they're talking about Mm -hmm. when they say hustle 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 Uh but there are a lot of these motivational like dudes out there oh yeah on Instagram, and they're always dudes, right? Like mm-hmm. always these dudes with like tight T-shirts. I don't know why. And they have goals. Yeah, they have these goals, like daily and goals. If you're not like blah 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 affirmations. Yeah, and I don't care how much in debt you are. Like if you hustle the right, if you think about your goals twenty four seven, if you have your mind right, and they all say the same thing. And I don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, I don't know what this goal is. I don't know. It's self-improvement, I guess. Yeah, but... And, and it's the gym thing also. It, it is. And it's like intermittent fasting. It's um, <laughs> keto dieting. A lot of this... No, it's paleo dieting. No, keto is the new thing, babe. Is it? Yeah. Paleo is like your generation. Oh, I see. Yeah. It's a variation of that. I felt very much like I was watching one of those ridiculous Instagram videos about hustling. Mm-hmm. And they kept on talking about being great. Yeah. So so that <laughs> this character... The kid, Mm -hmm. there's nothing likable about this kid at all. He's a shitty kid. He's just a piece of shit. And he's your protagonist. Mm -hmm. He's the one you're supposed to root Mm -hmm. for. He has no love for music. Mm -hmm. He wants to be the best. And it's in every scene in the movie, there's a scene at the dinner table, Mm -hmm. a jock comes in and says, hey, I got first string or whatever he says. Mm -hmm. And then this dickhead drummer turns to him and said, you're playing for Division Three. Right, the obvious yeah. attack there being, who the fuck are you? Yeah. I mm-hmm. am playing first chair mm-hmm. with studio band or whatever they were calling mm-hmm. it. And, and then they have that, this argument about, oh, like Charlie Parker was dead at 38 and you said he actually died at 34. No, he, they said he was 34, but I'm pretty sure it was 38. Okay. Yeah. And they made some wild accusations about him being like dying... Yeah, he was like, uh, you know, the, the cliche of yeah. the drunk heroin, heroin addict. addicted in, yeah. the, in the alley yeah. after a gig kind of thing. And the kid says, well, he'll be more famous than you'll be dying comfortably at age 80 or something like that. At 90. Yeah. What a like fucking a... dick. Yeah. And also, this is a very strange thing to do if that's your goal. Yeah. His whole goal, he, there's no love of music. There's no love of jazz. He wants to be famous. Yeah, but that's a very strange thing to do if you want to be famous. Yeah, play drums. Yeah. (laughs) Jazz drums. Like, what are you doing? (laughs) Right. 
<laughs> That's true. the opposite of what you do when you yeah. want to be famous and right. rich. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> I also thought it was interesting that his famous, favorite drummer is Buddy, Buddy Rich, Rich yeah. who that is so known good. as the yeah. fastest drummer in the world yeah. and also known for being a complete dick. <laughs> And very uh, performative in yeah. like a really wrong way. Yeah, he was fast. And yeah. and there's the other thing, just from a drummer's perspective, like, you know, there's this thing called World's Fastest Drummer, which mm-hmm. I've always hated. I've heard of this. Where can you, how fast can you do single mm-hmm. stroke rolls? And I remember like way back, I was on, remember the days of forums, internet forums, mm-hmm. where you'd post on forums and have discussions on forums. There was a drummer forum and they were talking about World's Greatest Drummer. And it would create these debates mm-hmm. about why the hell is this even important now speed in your hands is is important the, the faster you can do single stroke mm-hmm. rolls it's great you know you can play more stuff but it doesn't it doesn't really make you a better drummer mm-hmm. it makes you a faster drummer so you can play faster tempos on the ride mm-hmm. cymbal but that's like the least important thing and so whenever we'd see him mm-hmm. like the teacher is knocking him down and he would go woodshed he would do things very fast right. he would try to speed himself up and even the teacher is saying play faster play faster as if speed is the most important thing in playing the it drums. was very strange and also it was there were some really confusing things like he would the teacher jk simmons who's played by jk simmons it's so unfortunate because like i hated him the whole time but it's not the actor's fault at all i think he won an oscar for this. he won an oscar yeah. for best supporting actor i remember mm-hmm. i was sitting there watching the oscar saying don't give it to him don't give it to yeah him. don't give it to him and they gave it to him but i also thought it was a very weird performance maybe because the whole thing was really weird but it wasn't... Well, he was comical. Like, yeah. you wanted to laugh every time he said something or yeah. did something. Yeah, it was... And, and then they have these scenes where the kid who died mm-hmm. and he starts crying. Yeah. And this is like 10 minutes after he just told a kid, stop being a pussy or whatever he said. It, it was Stop the, being a little girl no, and crying. Yeah. And it was also like he kept on using the F word to everybody, yeah. whether they were gay or not. Well, and he, was, he would yeah. do gay, yeah, gay yeah. stuff and then derogatory... Yeah. towards women you know calling them girls and yeah. stuff like that but but what, but I, I wanted one of those guys to say ha ha little girl you're crying <laughs> no but also none of those jokes or you know the he was saying he was insulting you know these like nothing he, funny about nothing any of them. funny and there was nothing clever about any of it so there's a movie i thought of right have you seen full metal jacket no okay uh, Stanley Kubrick, basically about a drill sergeant drilling into this guy, mm-hmm. trying to toughen him up. And it's kind of a similar thing. Mm-hmm. But what the drill sergeant does is funny. Mm-hmm. It's it, it's in, you know, today it wouldn't fly. Mm-hmm. But it's at least it's really funny. The mm-hmm. things he says is really funny. And it's a great dynamic. And there you have a genius filmmaker, you know, dealing mm-hmm. with a similar kind of situation. Of course, sorry for the spoiler. But the guy <laughs> shoots him. Mm-hmm. with a rifle mm. and then takes the rifle and points it at his own puts it in his own mouth and shoots mm-hmm. himself um and i was thinking about it while watching the movie yeah. this time it's wildly unnecessary this di- display of abuse was so not constructive at all it was so unproductive nobody does this in this kind of context nobody yeah i don't think even cl- in classical music this happens people think that it happens in ballet Apparently, it doesn't really. Mm-hmm. There were a lot of um, ballet dancers who were pointing out how inaccurate um, the Black Swan was, Black okay. Swan movie mm-hmm. was. But this was infinitely worse than Black Swan. I think it came out... Well, that in Black Swan, it felt real. It felt yeah. like there was a real relationship going on there. Um, and a real story. <laughs> yeah, and a real story. And yes, yeah, something was developing. Right. Her mental... Yeah attitude you know Mm -hmm. her psychosis was developing there was none of that in this movie in this movie i had a hard time understanding what the point was yeah so to go back to that question i don't know what this movie is supposed to say Mm -hmm. or what it's supposed to mean or how we're supposed to feel about any of these people at all Mm -hmm. i think that jk rowling uh, sorry jk simmons jk simmons character is a bad guy Mm -hmm. and he proves himself to be a bad guy at the end right where you think maybe there's going to be some redemption there Mm -hmm. i guess you could call it a twist even though you can you're not surprised except let me point out another problem so this guy set up this very important gig Mm -hmm. with all of these musicians to suck Mm -hmm. in front of him yeah in front of what is apparently the most important gig in their careers 
You've got a 20-piece band yeah. who are going to fail mm -hmm. because you want to embarrass... Okay, so I feel like, let's back up a little bit All there. Right. We need to explain the context <sighs> of this situation. Okay. So the protagonist, Andrew, studies at this conservatory, and he works really hard, quote-unquote, works really hard, to play double-time swing. I'm sorry, I just had to make a crack about the double-time okay. swing. Um, in J.K. Simmons' big band, Mm -hmm. And this is the part that really does that I don't understand. What is this Lincoln Center gig that he's talking about? This Lincoln Center performance that they keep alluding to that happens like all the time. Well, there's a couple of different performances. There okay. was the performance where he crashed the car. Yes. I think that was the, that Lincoln... Was the Lincoln Center perf student performance. It was a competition. It was yeah. a competition. The right? one at the end was something called JVC. The Jazz Festival at the Lincoln Center. So okay. this movie is claiming that <laughs> Blue Note and EMC... <laughs> yeah, I thought it was funny he said EMC <laughs> Records. I don't know why EMC Records makes like me laugh. People, no, There's but nobody from EMC Records in nobody, that audience. This ridiculous thing that they are implying is that Somehow, the executives at Blue Note and EMC come to these competitions, these student competitions, and then based on big band performances, they pull out individual yeah, players right, right, like right, they, right. as if they would draft basketball players. I didn't even think of that, but you're right. Yeah, it doesn't... <laughs> and they would sign them to yeah. their labels, like Blue Note, <laughs> based on a big band competition... Mm -hmm like a university level big band competition, some blue note executive is going to single you out yeah. and give you a record deal. That's, that's what they point. were saying. Yep. And that's what I was laughing at the whole time. I was like, this is, mm -hmm. I know enough to know that that makes zero sense. So this is the problem with the movie is that right. the stakes, mm -hmm. you know, the whole idea of stakes in a movie, you want the, the tension to rise by raising the stakes. There's no stakes in this movie. <laughs> it's it, just it, a when you, But when you put up the stakes... They're artificial. They're yeah. not right. And they're, it's a completely made up world. It's like practically science fiction, except that we're supposed to pretend that this is real. Mm -hmm. And that's the, you know, in the very beginning when we started this podcast, mm -hmm. I said something and I will stand by it, which is I hate it when a movie makes us pretend that something is real. Yeah, I remember you For the sake that. of the plot. Right. That is my pet peeve when it comes to movies. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can do that when it comes to science fiction, when it comes to surrealism, but I can't do it when it's not when they're when they're trying to trick us into, you know, believing that something is real when it's clearly not. Mm -hmm. And a lot of New York movies do this, a lot of movies about Paris do this. And a lot of movies about sports do this. Well, you know, they really used to do this in the 1950s when they thought nobody cared about yeah, reality. Yeah, yeah, That's and it's how like, you get Korean actors playing Japanese characters. Uh, totally, <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. But even that I can forgive, but I can't forgive things like bad performances that we're supposed to pretend are good, you mm -hmm. know, that kind of thing. Or, you know, these kind of situations that make zero sense mm -hmm. even to somebody who's not in this world. Mm -hmm. Like, I was like... Blue note? I, it just made zero sense. Yeah. And then there was another thing where that he would just push the drummers to play faster, but right. he would be counting in like yeah, the quarter note. Yeah, his counting was yeah. wrong. He, he held up a cowbell and didn't seem to understand. Where the quarter note was? Yeah. Like I was like, I'm I think so he confused. was doing whole notes, but it was his whole notes were whole really notes. weird. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, that was so like, who does that notes? though? I don't know. Um, but one thing that I wanted to ask you Mm. is why was he counting off the tunes that way? Like five, six, and five, six, and... Because it's in 14, eight times. Okay. So okay, he's counting it, to seven. Yeah. So it's yeah. five, six, it's, and he would count, like he wouldn't do a full count, you notice. Yeah. He didn't want to make it too easy for them to have the tempo. Got it. So he's like five, six, and, and then they're playing in right. 14, eight time. So he's basically only giving them three pulses in order right. to get the tempo, which right. is very difficult to do. Exactly. So that, but that whole thing was quite accurate okay. and, and a dickhead move. Yeah. Again. Yeah. But that was quite accurate. Okay. So it was kind of like the martial arts training of the whole thing. Yeah, you're supposed yeah. to be able to be Pick right up. there yeah, okay. um, and and <laughs> be able to hit it. And then he would make them play like two measures. And then they and he then, already has decided. Yeah, he's yeah. already he's like no. And then they had to switch places like really fast. Yeah. And then they were bleeding by all the of them end were of bleeding, the yeah. and there's blood all over the drums. <laughs> and then he had this corny line where he says, he "Buddy, clean yeah. the blood off of my drum kit." Yeah. <laughs> 
We both burst into laughter. The whole thing was so corny. So this just, I think this all underscores that the problem, you shouldn't be competitive in music. Music shouldn't be competitive against each other like Mm. this. And I think what the director wanted to do, Mm -hmm. I don't know, but was to make a sports movie out of music. Yeah, yeah. Because this is how sports movies move. There was a very rocky kind of feel. Totally. It was a boxing movie. There was sweat everywhere. There was blood everywhere. You know, like you're telling your understudy, fuck off, this is my set. I was laughing too hard. And they just don't talk. Like, (laughs) if you have an understudy, you don't talk like that. It's this big dickhead. Okay, so this leads me to what I realized watching this movie the second time. There's a very incel element to this movie. (laughs) Yes. What I know of incels. Yes. Okay. I agree. There's a subplot of him meeting a girl in the movie theater. He asks her out. It's extremely awkward. And it's fine if he's obviously he's a musician, you know, like Mm -hmm. me, I was very shy when I was young, awkward around girls and all that kind of stuff. But I was never like really like that, like sending off psycho signals. Mm Mm-hmm. They have a scene in the movie where the two have a date. They talk about nothing. Mm. They paint her as someone interested in nothing. We don't learn anything about her. And then at the end of the scene, she kind of taps his foot, which means I like you. Yeah. We never see her again Mm -hmm. until he does this spiel where he sits her down and says, I'm going to be a genius and you're going to hold me back. So we have to break up. Yes. That was very uh, okay. Yeah. The third scene, we don't even see her. Talks on, talk, calls her on the phone. This is after he's crashed to the bottom and is about to rise again. Mm-hmm. Then he calls her, Dick, and says, "Come see my show." Mm-hmm. First of all, you just told her, right. "Don't get in my way while I'm working not towards mm-hmm. my genius." And then he calls her and says, "Come as mm-hmm. I'm working on my genius." Right. So he has obviously no feelings for another person. Mm-hmm. He never expressed any feelings for her at all. Well, I don't know why she was even in this movie. I don't this know character. why she was in the movie. I don't know why she liked him. Right. Except that you had to. I don't understand the subplot. I think the reason she was put in this movie was to convey how dedicated he was to drugs. I think you're absolutely right. I think you're absolutely right. That's the only purpose. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, you can't come along with me. I'm so dedicated. I think what you're pointing out there is a lot of what this movie is trying Mm -hmm. to do. It's the idea of dedicate yourself, overcome your hardships, overcome the abuse that I'm giving you in order to be great. And this leads me to my next thought. Right. I think this is a movie for people who love Jordan Peterson. You're absolutely right. So Jordan Peterson, I bet that this kid five years from now Mm -hmm. has all of Jordan Peterson's books on his bookshelf. Mm -hmm. I know there are a lot of Jordan Peterson fans out there, and they're mm-hmm. very aggressive. Mm-hmm. And I'm sorry if I'm annoying you, but I don't like him. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to get into that. I'm not going to slam him or anything. Right, right. But there is this kind of thing of, I didn't have a strong enough father in my life mm-hmm. to whip me into shape and abuse me into being great. Totally. So I need a strong person to replace my father mm-hmm. and abuse me so that I can become great. Mm-hmm. That's fucked up. Yeah. And also there's this idea of women are a distraction kind of thing. Totally. So yeah. that's the other thing. Yeah. So that women are ancillary to all of this. Mm-hmm. That you have to, you know, <laughs> achieve your greatness through mm-hmm. basically sitting in a room, which is basically what he does the whole movie. Yeah. When he need when he feels like he needs to get better, he's sitting by himself and playing fast. And yeah. that's his that's his way is to isolate himself and play fast. That's why I'm saying this whole movie had like this Instagram hustle bro energy. It was like yeah, yeah. It was why it was like I accidentally watched this really popular hustle person on Instagram who yells at you about nothing. Um, his name is Gary V. Okay. And do we want to give him a shout out like you just did? Uh, everybody knows who he is. I okay. Think. So he's not going to benefit from this podcast. He's not <laughs> hey, gonna gain another. Hey, don't sell the pod short. <laughs> we may, you know, if we work hard enough, we have somebody outside of us to abuse us. We can have the number one podcast. No, if we hustle hard. If enough. we hustle hard yeah, and enough. If we manifest. If we manifest. <laughs> if we greatness. Yeah. <laughs> and anyway, bleed. Yes. But anyway, so Gary V is kind of like. Actually, a lot of Gary V followers follow Jordan Peterson. Surprise. Yeah. 
And there was actually, this, I don't even know who Gary V is. My, I ahead. mean, he's just basically the mo- the a dumber version of Jordan Peterson. From what I've known, know of Jordan Peterson, he's not dumb. That's what makes him so. I think he's not dumb. He's talking out of his element. He's yeah. talking about things he doesn't know about. But the thing is, I know they're not going to listen to this, but I know a couple of people who really follow him, who are close to follow him. who Jordan Peterson. I do too. I have yeah. people in my family who <laughs> yeah. like him. Yeah. So I have like two close friends who follow him and buy his books, read his books. Um, he's very popular in Korea. Surprise. I, I think that's very typical. They think that because it's coming from somebody with a PhD and somebody who, you know, teaches at a university, it's somewhat more legitimate than like Gary Vee, for example. Right. Right. And that I think that's what makes it <laughs> even more annoying to me. <laughs> and yeah. it gives him more agency to talk about things that he frankly has no business talking about. Right. Like, um, And there's a lot of that going on. Well, there's a certain, again, I don't mean to... <laughs> I mentioned the word incel. Mm -hmm. That's its own thing, right? And then Jordan Peterson, I think, is it fair to say that there is overlap? I'm not going to say all Jordan Peterson fans are incels. Of course not. Of course not. Yeah. Um, I think some people take value in Jordan Peterson's writings. I think he's a charlatan. I think he talks about Mm -hmm. things he doesn't understand in order to dismiss it, in order to come to some other argument. The way he deals with philosophy, for example, mm-hmm. he does not n- understand a thing about Nietzsche mm-hmm. or Marx mm-hmm. or Lacan, but he mentions them all the time. People seem to gravitate to him as an authority to tell them to mm-hmm. clean up their shit. Right. And there's a strong element of that in this movie. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I'm all riled up now. Yeah, I think this movie was very upsetting to both of us. But people loved it. It's universally... Who loves it, though? Let me see. I, I don't I'm know just anybody gonna, who likes it. So I'm going to cheat our own podcast here, and I'm going to look up the reception to this movie. Critical response, 94% on Rotten Tomatoes. Mm. Intense, inspiring, well-acted, a brilliant sophomore effort from director Damien Chazelle. And a riveting vehicle for stars like J.K. Simmons and Miles Teller. So it has universal acclaim on Metacritic. This is coming from Wikipedia. Oh, actually, I just thought of somebody. Oh, listen to this. Mm-hmm. Variety magazine said that the film demolishes the cliches of the mu- musical prodigy genre, investing the traditionally polite stages and rehearsal studios of top-notch conservatory with all the psychological intensity of a battlefield or sports arena. <laughs> Hollywood Reporter loved it. Oh, my God. Sharp and gripping rhythm with shots, beautifully edited. Act- the editing was terrible. Mm-hmm. The The way that they shot and edited that last scene especially, it was kind of chaotic, but it was like a bunch of swish pans and cutting to things that weren't happening, mm-hmm. <laughs> like the drumming, you know, hitting a yeah, cymbal and totally. then nothing's happening. Yeah. And it was just terrible editing. I but thought. do you have to know the music to notice that kind of thing? Well, the we talked is. about Sound of Metal, right? Right. And that, the editing was fantastic. And the shooting, the yes. cinematography was fantastic. That's a movie that obviously loves music and loves drumming. This movie, I don't know. The editor didn't understand what the one is, you know, mm-hmm. the downbeat. Also, <laughs> it sounded like there's a lot of double kick kind mm, of yeah, stuff yeah, going yeah. on. And to your point, mm-hmm. if it offends me, then I'm 1% of the people who watches the movie, right? Mm-hmm. But it's still, it bothers me. It mm-hmm. bothers me when you're not going to be accurate, mm-hmm. if when you're not going to be true to the thing that you're trying to depict, the world I you're trying to depict. Agree. It's like if I had the budget, and just because I had the budget, I like if I decided to write and direct a movie about basketball, it would turn out exactly like that. That would be kind of fun to see, though. Yeah. I would like to see that movie if because you made that movie. even <laughs> the references that they throw out are so basic. Like, yeah, the greats, like... Louis Armstrong and Charlie Parker. No, it's and not that's only it. that. It's, yeah. yeah, but it's not only that. He said the people who had to become assholes. Yeah. But were Louis Armstrong and Charlie Parker assholes? I don't know. No, I don't know what, I don't even know what he was saying, like what he was trying to say, but it's like Louis Armstrong and Charlie Parker are from totally different, like. His point yeah, was but, that you <laughs> have to, that someone has to abuse you yeah. if you're going to be great. That's what his point was. Okay. And that makes him a bad guy. And obviously, okay, but why would you write it like that in a screenplay? Right. Why would you write those real life characters, right. yeah. even as an opinion, right. 
I don't know. Well, I want to touch on another thing, which is okay. there's this anecdote throughout the entire movie that keeps on reoccurring, which is the Charlie Parker anecdote. About the symbol. Yeah, this uh, Charlie Parker and Joe Jones. So the legend goes, and I heard this, you know, mm-hmm. when I started being interested in jazz, when I started hanging with like jazz cats or whatever. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And apparently Charlie Parker um, went to a jam session and played I, I think got lost in the changes but kept on playing a solo that was too long and joe jones finally had it and threw a symbol at him right mm-hmm. um the movie says that he threw a symbol towards his head like in an attempt to decapitate him which is entirely inaccurate he basically threw the symbol on the floor and he's like get off the okay. stage yeah mm-hmm. so it was like a heated moment that ignited bebop history which was like so charlie parker went into the woods and like literally went into the woods to shed right yeah <laughs> to practice right, okay. for like a year or something and then he came back and he was like playing all these bebop licks that okay. we know you know the same thing happened yeah. to robert johnson actually this, oh, this is the legend really? of robert okay. johnson that he yeah. went off for a year and came back and he was a genius yeah so that's the legend of charlie parker and they keep on using this and the inaccurate version of you know this violent image of like this drummer throwing a symbol at the saxophone player <laughs> So it's very similar to the idea that mm-hmm. Louis Armstrong and Charlie Parker had to be assholes in order to be good. I see. So I think you're kind of saying a similar thing to what yeah, I'm saying. Yeah, but I was just, I didn't appreciate this inaccurate anecdote that was sort of the basis of this whole movie. Right. And it's tarnishing the tradition of bebop. I really, mm-hmm. in, like, you know, I, it's like I wanted to ask the movie director, like, do you even like Charlie Parker? Right. I want to ask the movie director, do Do you you like jazz? Yeah, exactly. Do you enjoy listening to jazz? Do you feel something when you hear? That's it. Is there joy in your heart when you hear the music? Yeah. Yeah. Because there's none of that in the movie. Is he just uh, an anecdotal, like, you know, thing to you? Like, you know, the fact that, and, you know, the whole death thing, the early death thing. Yeah. Right. Which... Yeah, he died early, but so did a lot of other... But that's not the point. Well, of, it is part yeah. of the legend. It, I mean, if you want to get into the idea of genius, right. genius doesn't come because someone was an asshole to you. Genius comes because you work at it, you work really hard at it, and you love it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I got the work hard at it part. I mm-hmm. didn't see any love for jazz yeah. at all yeah, in this exactly. movie. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It begs the question, does he even like... Jazz. Do you like Charlie Parker? Do you like this music? Do you have mm-hmm. you met? Do you have any friends who are drummers? <laughs> like what? Right, you know, right. Like, did you talk to anybody? Yeah. Did you? Did nobody watch this before it went out? Is what mm-hmm. my question. It was like, and then another thing is like, why didn't this kid Andrew gig? Why was this okay? Bebop so this is another thing. Yeah. So this, this is another. Yeah. This is great. So he's someone who apparently learned everything by masturbating at home, uh, 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 practicing at home, <laughs> yeah. or by playing in the jazz band in school. Yeah, like what? Did the Did this fuck? guy ever go out and get some musicians together and try to go out and play a gig, or even like a jam session? Yeah. Do we ever see him enjoying the process yeah. of music in any way at all? He's got pictures on his wall. Yeah. But because you know how you get signed to Blue Note if you ever do start a band. Yeah, or go to jam sessions in New York. That's the that's the thing. Yeah. If you want to be a musician, if you want to get noticed, go out, play in a shitty band. Yeah. Then level up, mm-hmm. play with some better people, then level up again, play with some better people and go do some shows. And he lives in Manhattan where these living <laughs> right. legends, they gig, they host jam sessions. Like go to no, Smalls. No, but the other thing, yeah. I, I don't believe that he actually loves, he, he would never do that. Yeah, I, exactly. Andrew would never do that because you know what? When he gets to his nadir, his his lowest point, he just gives it up. Yeah. And then you see him passing by a poster about a jazz festival. He doesn't even want to go to the jazz festival. He yeah. doesn't say, look at the dates and say, uh-huh. oh, I'm going to check out some music. Again, when I was 13, I gave up the drums because my mm-hmm. um, my teacher was an asshole. But I still love music. Yeah. I don't think this kid loves music. Mm-hmm. At all, which makes me wonder if the director does. And he doesn't love other does. drummers. Drummers, so, yeah. all the drummers I know, they're so excited about other drummers. They're like, oh my God, did you see this guy? They're always looking at, they're always watching YouTube videos of like drummers tearing it up. I'll tell you what, here's yeah. another thing about drummers that mm-hmm. might be different from people like guitar players mm-hmm. and maybe even singers. Mm-hmm. 
first of all, drummers like to hold back. You know, they yeah. usually, I, I don't want to essentialize the personality of a drummer, but they're usually not someone who wants to be forward and singing or, mm-hmm. or playing the guitar solos. Drummers and drummers are usually really cool with each other. I saw that. Yeah, um, I can see that. Like in when I was living in Chiang Mai, like, you know, when Rod would play or mm-hmm. when Peng would play. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm just naming these peop- these drummers who are in Chiang Mai. I love listening to them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, then they'd hear me play. And it was a nice community. Yeah. There was none of this competition stuff going on. There was drummers really kind of get along. Oh, yeah. And they... And they learn from each other is what I noticed. Right. And they're yeah. different and they're so stylistically yeah. different. It's a different huge strengths. element. Yeah. Yeah. It's a huge element of the community, especially mm-hmm. the jazz community mm-hmm. in New York. Right. I know for a fact that they are constantly going to each other's gigs. They're constantly just out there trying to play because they just want to have fun. They want to play. Yeah. And you also want to learn, you know, and, yeah. and um, see what people are doing and... And show your support. And there was none of that element of music in yeah, this Yeah, and no, I never got the impression that he wanted to play. Exactly. And playing, I'm not talking about him in his basement doing whatever he was doing when he was practicing. Because the practice uh, scenes were really weird. And at one point I looked at you and I was like, what the fuck is he doing? Well, it's, I don't know what he was doing, to be honest. <gasps> he I don't was know. all sweating and like He was crazy. trying to play as fast as he can and because he was speed bleeding. is the most important thing. But what he was playing was just noise. He was bleeding the uh, whole time. So... And sweating profusely and like crying. And then at one point he punches. Oh, that was great. <laughs> that was great. He punch and that's an- <laughs> another cliche. <laughs> he pun- he gets so frustrated because he can't play fast enough mm-hmm. with his little I don't know, whatever he's doing. <laughs> He punches his fist through the snare drum. First of all, you can't really do that. Yeah. I don't know. I've never tried, but I don't think that, I don't think you can punch a fist through the snare. Maybe you can, but if the drum head's made of paper. I know you paper, can break the, the bass drum somehow. Oh, you can right? break the snare yeah, head, yeah, but yeah. but with a stick, which has oh, a, yeah, yeah. this incredible force behind it. But it almost never happens. Right. Movies about music. Oh, God. I would like to I'm exhausted. Conclude, yeah, conclude sure. Okay. A little bit because, I'm all fired up. Go yeah. ahead. So <laughs> we rewatched this movie for the sake of the podcast. I'm never going to see it again. Right. And I never wanted to see it again when I first watched it. But on my second viewing, it just made me hate it even more. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. Um, so my last question would be this. Like I, earlier, I said something. I said Jordan Peterson was making... He often talks about stuff that he has no business talking about. And I've gotten into trouble for saying this publicly. And somebody (laughs) attacked me saying, you're against freedom of speech because you're saying that only certain people have the right to talk about. That's not what I... Okay, freedom of speech and what I'm talking about are two very different things. Well, can I stop you there? You have freedom of speech. You don't have freedom... Or if what you say dismisses somebody Mm -hmm. else unfairly or... Mm -hmm inaccurately, Mm -hmm. then you should be attacked for that. Yeah, totally. But it has nothing to do with freedom of speech because I am not the government that is infringing on your right. Like, you know, I'm not banning. I don't have the power to ban anybody from saying anything. But the question that kept on coming to my head is, because I was, I kept on saying, why does this movie exist? Like, how did this camp come out? Yeah, back to that question. Um, What do you think about that? Like, you know, we obviously hate this movie, Mm -hmm. but it has every right to exist. Sure. And every, anybody has every right to like it. Sure. Right. I'm glad you made those points. Yes. So... It is entirely our fault that we watched it again. Like that, you know, it's like we can't hold this movie responsible for our feelings. But what I'm trying to get to is this. This movie, actually, I've been talking about how like I'm able to separate the art from the artist or whatever. This movie made me realize that maybe I can't because I hate the director and the writer. I have no respect for this person. And that is probably why I hated La La Land, too, because mm. I hated this movie so much with such a deep passion that I could not separate the writer-director, this Damien guy. When I watched mm. La La Land, I didn't realize it was the same director right. as Whiplash. Well, good, but I couldn't. And so I was like, for, I'm forever biased now against this person who did nothing wrong to me. But I can't separate because... 
the brain that came up with this movie has to be someone that I don't, like, that I cannot, I can never respect. Like, I can't respect any of his other work because he reached into his brain and pulled out this movie, unironically. Yeah, I gave him another shot. I watched the movie First Man because Mm -hmm. I heard that the sound design was really incredible. Mm -hmm. And I was bored to tears. I actually was just waiting for the final or the, the penultimate scene maybe when when um, he lands on the moon mm-hmm. because I heard it was so realistic. But I was so incredibly bored. I started doing other things. Mm-hmm. Like I think I started doing my laundry while the movie yeah. was playing because I didn't want to turn it off. Mm-hmm. But what I'm saying is I cannot separate this movie with the person who wrote it. I can't. I think that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. I can separate an artist from the work. Yes. So I I can appreciate the work even if the artist is a scumbag. And I do totally. this often. Yeah, me too. This especially goes for philosophy. Like one of my favorite philosophers, Schopenhauer, threw an old woman down the stairs. I still like Schopenhauer's philosophy. Well, I think Roman Polanski is one of the greatest. So there's directors. an example. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's an example. Too. I mean, we could go down the list. But no, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about... I know. And yeah. so you're not talking about mm-hmm. that. So here's a case where I don't like the art. And I'm also not going to like the artist. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Here's a case where the art was so bad that I judge him for it. I judge the art- artist for it. I got you. Yeah. And I agree with you. That's why we will not be doing La La Land because I cannot sit through La La Land again. So we decided we weren't going to do musicals. Mm -hmm. I think we can do musicals if they're about music. And La La Land would be one, but Mm -hmm. I don't... I don't want to sit through that again. I don't want to sit through it again either. So just a little announcement to everybody that we're not going to do La La Land. (laughs) But Cece. Yes. I don't know if you know what movie we're going to be doing next. I don't actually. I started Mubi again. Oh, yes, you did. So I subscribed to Mubi. And they have The Double Life of Veronica. Or, as you would say it in French, La double vie de Véronique. I think that's it. it. So we're going to watch that next time. Okay. All right. So if you have movie, it's on movie. All right. It's an art movie, so we're going to move into this art movie realm. You're Mm going to have to try to stay awake. Okay. Which is a challenge sometimes. Yes. (laughs) But you've been very good with our podcast. You're like totally into the movies that we watch, which is great. Yes. So... We will look forward to that in two weeks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And please give us some uh, love on the reviews and the ratings and subscribe, please. And if you want to share it on social media, that Mm -hmm. would be fantastic. And if you have any comments, a great way to comment is our Instagram page at Movies About Music. That's right. Mm -hmm. If you want to cuss us out about... (laughs) Yeah, if you disagree, we always like to get some dialogue. I'm not so great with facts and background and, and information like that. So if you got anything wrong or we've been unfair, please let us know. Yes. Till next time. Take care. Yeah. Under the moonlight I'll sing you a song So you'd magically feel a lot less alone Hopefully they'll live eternally If we paint ourselves all bright with stories Of heroes and poets and sadness and war of immeasurable pain, unconditional love, movies are